Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, we're tackling uh, different topics this fall, and this week we're tackling the, the tough issue of poverty. Now, poverty means not having enough of something. And uh, unfortunately, in our world, I, we still have, uh, I found this snazzy picture that I could use without copyright issues, but technically it's one in six children, the latest updates I saw, live in poverty. But in the, uh, in un, undeve in the developing world, there's still one in five and other things said. So somewhere between uh, one in five and one in six children still lives in poverty today. I mean, I think that alone is enough to make it a serious issue for us to tackle. And our focus today is particularly on what the church uh, can do, and it's pretty simple. We share Christ, we share life, and we share our resources. Like uh, all the other issues we're going to tackle in our series, it's important for us to remember we can't fix, for instance, world poverty. We can't fix it not on our own, and uh, essentially we'd say, in this life, it will never get fixed. As Jesus said, you will always have the poor with you. But just because we can't do everything doesn't mean we should do nothing, right? Um, our faith and our love in Christ compel us to not just sit on the sidelines in these kinds of issues, but to have compassion when we encounter poverty uh, of any sort. So we usually think of poverty in terms of um, poverty of uh, a lack of money, but poverty can come in a variety of forms, po a lack of, of other sorts of resources, lack of, of love, uh, a variety of things. And the Bible is pretty clear that when it comes to people in need, it's important for us not just to talk or to teach or even just to pray, but to do something. James says, talking especially about Christians in need, kind of like John was saying in our epistle lesson, imagine a brother or sister who's without clothes and daily food. If one of them says to, if one of you says to them, oh, go in peace, keep warm and well-fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. In our reading for this morning from Zechariah, uh, we're kind of jumping into the middle of the story, but the reading had kind of two distinct parts. The first part was, was why God's people had been punished, because in Zechariah they have returned from the exile to Jerusalem, and God is kind of mercifully reestablishing them. But the first half is why God punished them, and then the second half in chapter 8 is talking about what God's good plan is for them. Now, in Zechariah's day, the people were more aware than they had been in the past that we need God. They were very aware. They had just been punished, and they had only come back by God's grace. They knew this. So they knew they also wanted to be on God's good side, but they thought that the way that they could do that was perhaps by being more pious, following some extra rules that they put in place. Or they, they had created extra holidays uh, and they were regulars and worship, fasting, and, and they thought maybe that acting sad would please God. You know, in other words, they'd put on a good show. Sometimes when we get in trouble, we might put on a good show to, so, so people can see just how sorry we are. But Yahweh says, feel free to eat. I didn't tell you to stop eating. You can eat, but you just need to share. I don't care whether you eat lunch or fast. However, I care very much if you refuse to take care of the widow or the fatherless or the outsider. Basically, what Yahweh is saying is, I don't need you to stop eating lunch, but I do need you to share your lunch. In Zechariah chapter 9, verses, chapter 7, verses 9 through 10, Yahweh says, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Render, God, Yahweh is trying to say, here's what I really want. Render true judgments. Show kindness and mercy to one another. Do not oppress the widow 
the fatherless, the sojourner, or the poor, and let none of you devise evil against one another in your heart. See, obviously, the, re the fact that God has to say this shows that God's people weren't really doing a good job of this. They were taking advantage of whoever they could. We could read in Zechariah or in books like uh, Nehemiah about some more specifics. They weren't paying attention to the widow and the fatherless. This was one of Yahweh's main causes of anger and judgment upon Jerusalem. You know, there was nothing new. Moses, Isaiah, Jeremiah, many others had warned, if you're not good to one another, if you're not faithful to me, you'll be punished. Jerusalem was supposed to be God's city, the capital of his people, and it shouldn't just look like any other corrupt or wicked city. Jerusalem was supposed to be a city on a hill, a shining example of how God's plans and kingdom were true and fair and better than the worldly alternatives. Yahweh says, things were meant to be different among my people. In fact, he says, one day things will be different among my people. And here's where Zechariah pivots in chapter 8. Zechariah paints a beautiful picture of God's plans for the city of Jerusalem. He says, um, one day my people will have peace and security so they can grow old. The elderly will be so respected they can sit outside on their porches enjoying retirement without fear or fraud. Kids will play in the streets. You'll establish your, your own vineyards and orchards, not just, not just uh, vegetables, but you'll have fruit orchards, things that take years to establish, and you'll enjoy them. You'll be happy and healthy and, uh, in this good city. That's what I want for you. That's my plan. The problem with God's plan, good plan was, though, that God's people didn't seem to want the same thing. At least they were not making the choices that would lead to such a city. Their choices were, and attitudes were um, the establishing the wrong kind of city, the wrong kinds of relationships. Their greed and their corruption and selfishness were the opposite of what God wanted. God was inviting his people into a good society. This is, this is all of Israel's history, really, which is partly what Zechariah is reflecting on. God was trying to invite his people into a good society, but they had to be on board, or their selfishness, greed, and jealousy were going to undermine God's good plan. See, God still wants a good society. God still wants, perhaps more, relative, or more relevant to us is that God wants the church to be a good place. Now it's no longer a country that is supposed to be the shining example. It's God's people scattered throughout the world, including us. But God's people in Isaiah's day, um, uh, Zechariah's day, uh, needed their hearts changed. And, and the only way that God's good society can come about here on earth, or in a sense even in heaven, is when we are on board. Now, we can't do that on our own, we're told in the New Testament. We need God to transform and change our hearts. We won't fix things on our own. And that's part of why the church, I think that we say, the world can't fix these problems because the problems can't be fixed uh, until hearts are changed. Um, but once God has changed our hearts, here on earth, the only way that we can make any progress um, towards towards what God wants is when we too are willing to share. And, and uh, it's easy to just think it's about money, but it's not. It's not just about money. If we look at Jesus, he barely had any money, if any at all. He had to go fishing to find money. Um, but if Jesus shared his time, he shared his care for those who were poor, including those who were poor in spirit, the sick, the dying, and the spiritually desperate. The church's solution is not just a money solution. It's a heart, soul, and body answer, not just a matter of, of money. Um, rather, we are encouraged to share time, our care, or perhaps our lunch. 
There were uh, over 5,000 people, uh, plus women and children, the one time, you might recall. And Jesus asked his disciples to share their lunch with them. Jesus, again, didn't have many earthly position, uh, possessions. However, he was willing to share his gifts, healing, his preaching, and forgiving the world. Jesus came, as he said at the very beginning of his ministry, to proclaim freedom for the prisoners, to set the captives free. He ate with sinners. He forgave, the her, the, he forgave them, and he helped the hurting. Jesus often, regularly, allows his plans to be interrupted because he's moved with compassion when he comes across those in dire need. Now, again, you and I certainly are limited. We are not our Savior. Uh, We can't share to the same degree that Jesus did. Yet, while we can't bring salvation, people salvation, there's much we can share with them. We can, of course, share Jesus with them. And I guess in that sense, we can share salvation with them when we share our Lord with them. Um, and, but God has given all of us many resources. Even if we're low in uh, money resources, we have a variety of other resources, things like our time, simply our ears, our attention that we can to pay, to pay uh, attention to people, even, of course, including material blessings. Now, again, I think the right, it's good to have the right sort of attitude when, a, when a tackling uh, problems. Um, and we, I don't think we can fix these problems. We can't fix it. But what we can do is share. I can't fix world poverty. I can't fix every problem, but I can share. And so can you. Um, Jesus has given us exactly that sort of attitude. Of course, he shared all things with us, and he promises to take care of all things for us so that it's really not that risky for Christians to share because Jesus has promised he's going to take care of us. Um, of course, it's Jesus did not come only to fix material problems. He came to introduce a whole new way of living, a whole new kingdom. Jesus came to take care of the brokenness of this world and not just one piecemeal one part at a time. He did it all uh, by going to the cross. And uh, we have to be clear, we can't fix this world uh, on our own, but we can be changed and fixed by Jesus. And in turn, we can change lives of people around us, maybe in small ways, but still change them for the better by simply being generous, supportive, and sharing. Yet, um, uh, Jesus uh, invites us to join him on his, uh, in his kingdom. Uh, uh, a couple of uh, Jesus and we are, uh, it's, it's important to be clear that we can't fix this world on our own, but Jesus has, uh, in fact, started the process. And you know, he invites us to join with him. So we don't have to have the master plan to f- defeat poverty. We simply join Jesus. And listen to what he says. Um, And it's also really important. And it's easy. I don't know. I think it's easy for us to think about the poor versus us. You know, in other words, we're not poor. We just help people who are poor. Uh, But we're probably poor in ways that we are uh, uh, ignorant of. Uh, And and in fact, we are all poor very clearly. Uh, We are the poor in spirit, if nothing else. Um, yet God has made us rich in Christ. And, and if we forget, though, if we forget uh, that humility, if we think it's all about us fixing everything um, and we can make everything better, that's a, a, an error to avoid as well. We might, in fact, miss God's kingdom entirely if we start to take on an, an arrogant sort of attitude. Uh, Martin Luther famously said once, we are all beggars. Um, We are all beggars, and it would be better if we just admit it. It basically was kind of what he's saying. We we all are poor and before God. But we often think of ourselves not as beggars, but we sometimes think of ourselves as betters, better than others. We sometimes get callous to hurting around us, to the hurting around us, or we simply try not to get too close to it, or we avoid looking at it. We can become insular, just like the people in uh, Zechariah's day. 
We get caught up perhaps in, in work or uh, school stuff or play stuff or even church stuff and we say the right things but we still do some of the wrong things. We still avoid helping. We still, as in Zechariah's day, don't treat each other fairly but we even harbor bitterness, one of us against another. We are indeed, as Martin Luther said, all beggars. We are poor. God has given us so much, and yet too often we are not generous but greedy. The good news is, guilty as we are, yet Christ has not ignored our need. We are poor, and Christ has shared with us. He has had compassion on us. He has forgiven us our debts and paid what we could not. What a comforting verse from Romans chapter 5, verse 8. Um, While we were still sinners, God didn't wait for us to fix everything or turn everything around. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And because of that, we are rich because we have been reconciled to God, not with gold or silver, but with his holy, precious blood and with his innocent suffering and death. The Apostle Paul puts it this way, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that by his poverty you might become rich. You you hear that, right? God wants us to be rich. Maybe not in the way that some television pastors talk about it, but he does in fact want us to be rich. Rich in God's mercy and grace, No matter how much or how little money is in our bank account or how desperate our financial debt, you are rich because you are loved by the creator of the heavens and the earth. He saw you as more valuable than all the gold or silver in the world but gave up the life of his own son for your salvation. We can give thanks to God, certainly. But God also has given us a variety of different blessings, including our time, talents, and gifts, uh, material, spiritual, relational blessings, and probably ones I'm missing. As Christians, we see many different needs. And, And the great thing about the church and about us is that we all are in different areas. We all have different gifts. We have different ways that God calls us to share with others. Um, And so uh, as we come back to our our topic here, how can we tackle poverty? Well, we on our own certainly can't do all that much. But Jesus can. And he, of course, sets a great example for us. And furthermore, he gives us the hope and the promise, like Zechariah prophesied about, about a world where scarcity will no longer be an issue. An issue where changed hearts will no longer even be necessary because God will have changed our hearts and transformed our bodies and will have made all things right. We continue to preach about this hope, this kingdom of God, and in the meantime, we share. We can't help everyone, but we can help someone. And I don't know certainly exactly how God uh, will, how you will share or who God will put in front of you that you can share with. But as a follower of Christ, I'm confident that you will share. And so let's encourage and help one another to do exactly that in more and more ways so that we can in some way reflect our Savior, sharing our our stuff, sharing our time, and hopefully even sharing our Savior with those around us in in the world and sharing in both word and deed. In Jesus' name, amen.